Okay, welcome to part four and the last part of my video looking at Carl Bau's creation in the 21st century. This is an episode called Hugged by a Canopy and stars Dr. Larry Mitchum, who is an employee of Bau's Creation Evidence Museum. Uh, so I left off, he's, he's kind of summing up the, the canopy portion of the show and I'll get started. At the time of the canopy, prior to the flood, at that time, due to the, the fact that the diameter of the earth was slightly smaller. All right, now I'm confused. In other videos, you've expressively stated that you accept Walt Brown's hydroplate theory to explain, uh, you know, the movement of continents on the earth and the origin of the part, a portion of the floodwaters. Under the hydroplate theory, the diameter of the earth was slightly larger than current um, before the flood. Now you're saying it's slightly smaller? It's a little bit of a contradiction there. And we had the envelope or enveloping canopy approximately 10 miles above the earth, very, very thin canopy, but providing an envelope. All of the factors give us a ratio of saturation so that you do not need the 40% or the 35% or even the 30. We're working at around 25% with at least 50% humidity and that completely removes the angle of volatility. We believe the creation model is far superior. Yeah, you know what? I believe that if boys skip school and smoke cigars, they turn into donkeys. And I also believe that Julia Roberts is actually Eric Roberts in drag because I've never seen the two together. No. I'll I don't really believe those things. Um, but the point is, is that what what you believe to be true doesn't mean squat. What you can demonstrate to be true does. And based on the evidence that's been presented in this entire series, there, there's been zero evidence. There's been a whole bunch of non-evidence presented. A whole bunch of either relatively true, reasonably accurate biological facts, but then are the conclusions drawn from those facts are completely pulled out of your asses. Um, or just outright falsehoods about whales and dissolved oxygen and 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 such and you know it, it it's a non it, it doesn't make any sense um, one of the hallmarks of a good idea one way we can assess a, a, a hypothesis a suggestion a theory um, is looking at how many assumptions have to come along with how many uh, other assumptions have to be made in order to support it. And often, it doesn't mean it's always, but oftentimes the explanation that brings with it the, the, the least amount of other assumptions can also be true. Now I want to buy assumptions in here, I mean in this case I'm talking about invocation of unknown physical concepts, unknown principles. Um, so when we look at you know the gases stored inside amber and we look at the percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere and we we put a model together based on what we know about the modern atmosphere and we know about photosynthesis and we know about things like biomass at the time and we know from um, stabilized top analysis of, of fossil material uh, we look at it and we get a really good idea of what the climate was like during the during the Mesozoic as it varied throughout the Mesozoic and we can you know therefore make a hypothesis about how much oxygen, why that oxygen was present, and what effect that oxygen had on the things living at that time. Or we can invoke this magic canopy theory that involves physical laws which no longer apparently exist, um, involves uh, the actual existence of, of states of matter that are no longer with us, and invokes a unknown, unknowable, supernatural being I mean, it, all of these things come into play, and the only reason that those have to be invoked to explain this is so that the evidence, which is non-evidence, matches uh, old ancient writings, not actually any real observations of things we see. So it, it's 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 kind of bizarre, in my opinion, to even I mean. To, to, to compare the two, or let alone to say in any way that the canopy theory is superior. Um, when again, it uh, the, its superiority is a whole bunch of principles that Carl Bau, frankly, invented. Um, you know, his, his hyperbaric chamber that's supposed to scientifically demonstrate this, uh, I haven't seen a single claim. It, or I didn't keep 
include the clip, but he states that, um, you know, something about, like, I don't remember what it was, tremendous leaps forward in physics and chemistry are already coming out of this, 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 bios, uh, this hypobaric uh, biosphere research. But none of that's shown anywhere. It's not on his website. It's not anywhere. The claims specifically made on his website are a whole bunch of non-claims. Fruit flies live just as long as they do normally. Wow, that's pretty neat. Uh, vegetarian piranhas, which were vegetarian before they were put into the, the chamber because it, they're not really piranhas anyways, they're paku, um, grow just as fast as they do outside the chamber. Um, uh, th we have to rely on the great scientist Bayou Bob's visual analysis of, of venom, of, of poisonous snakes to determine that major changes occurred in it. Things like that. Though there's no actual evidence that this supposed uh, unique atmosphere had any effect on life, um, would have an effect on life, or needs to be invoked at all to explain what what we see in, in the natural world. So anyway, he goes on from this next part talking about Bible codes, and I'm not going to include much of it at all. I just, I just want a sampling, and then I'm going to talk about his Bible code garbage. But now, Larry, the big question. One of the areas where you have done tremendous uh, research that is world class in scope in addition to the other very fine research that you've done. This area has to do with the Bible codes. You've been able to ferret out information, not that the codes voluntary, uh, voluntarily give this information, but you've been able to program and see if that information is in the scriptures. Now, let's look at a chart that you've done having to do with the canopy. Now, let's explain a, in a thumbnail sketch what we're talking about in the Bible codes. The Hebrew rabbis have known for centuries, or have declared for centuries, that they, being very conversant with the Hebrew language, were able to detect that at skip sequences, uh, the names of God and the names of patriarchs and vital things were found. Uh, at skip sequences are encoded below the surface. All right, for, if you're not familiar with what this e exactly is, um, is this Bible code stuff? It takes the Bible, either the, in the original Hebrew or in, in an English translation, um, eliminates all the spaces between the words, and then puts them together into a set column width and and size, so that the entire Bible is laid out in, as one gigantic big block of text with no spaces in it. And then, just like in a word search, you know, you see those, like, you know, the newspaper, the word searches, um, it's exactly the same thing where you search for words in that pattern of letters. Now, obviously, you can see that if you change the width of, the, you know, how many letters per, per row, you're going to change the outcome. Um, and so what this computer program does is it changes the width, it alters that, um, and do it does these searches and also more more than just like a common word search thing is what it will do is it will go through and say it'll say it'll start at say the first letter skip 17 skip 17 skip 17 and see if there's a pattern and if there's no pattern if the word isn't found in that pattern then it goes to the second letter skip 17 skip 17 third letter skip 17 skip 17 and it will keep on doing this um, multiple iterations throughout the entire document that you're searching through looking for a specific pattern. Um, and anyway, I just thought hopefully that makes sense. So it's this giant word search thing. Now what these what they like to do is they like to say that if, if, if these patterns come up, in other words, where there's related words are crossed or they happen to occur in a specific place in the Bible, you know, like if it's the words about creation occur in the section of the Bible talking about creation, that the coincidences are so dramatically huge um, that it's impossible to happen by chance. Now, um, I'm going to put down below a link to a video by Michael Shermer uh, where he he basically destroys this idea uh, showing that it, it's simple. It, it, the, the odds that they calculate against it being true are, are completely skewed and that you can almost, you can come up with practically anything with this. So anyway, I'll let him go on. Hebrew, and uh, we, you simply, knowing the Hebrew quite well, are able to program a concept or a word or a name and see if it comes up, and see if it comes up in a cluster. Uh, we first gave the computer equal parameter of all the books in the Bible. We did not tell it where to look. 
That's important. Okay, we looked at all of what's called the tonic. All right, that's the Hebrew word for the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Everything from Genesis to the Malachi. We then listed some of the key elements that we thought were important in our canopy model. And that would be things like magnetic, things like frequency, things like light, things like uh, transparent, shield canopy, crystalline, uh, crystalline uh, things like rakia, the Hebrew word itself, um, things like uh, creation. We also look for Adam, Eve, Noah, and Abraham. Now this Bible code thing looked like too much fun for me to pass on. So I searched the internet and I found a, uh, a program called Skip Code Hunter that the author was generous enough to, to, to send me a free copy of. Um, and I, just for fun, uh, included in the package was uh, Origin of Species. So I loaded Origin of Species into the search thing and began searching for fun phrases and word clusters. I, I'll show you some of my results. So the first thing I searched for was Watson and Crick. Um, as you know, the, the, the co-discoverers or discoverers of uh, DNA's double helix. I also searched for Watson and Crick and double helix and found that as well. However, it, I had a, had some problems. The program crashed while I was trying to get a screen cap of it. And I, it, it took too much time and I didn't want to bother. I didn't go back to, to redo it. But here's Watson and Crick, as you can see, practically overlapping. Now I'm going to apologize for a lot of these are going to be close to impossible to see. You're going to have to take my word on it that they say what I say they say. I apologize for that. Um, it's just simply the, the field was too small to be readable and I didn't want to take that. Anyway, I'm lazy. Uh, the next one I searched for was uh, Shubin and Fishopod. Now, if you know Neil Shubin, the discoverer of Tiktaalik, uh, coined the term Fishopod as this transitional between amphibians and, uh, and fishes. And uh, so finding Shubin and Fishapod in such close proximity was pretty exciting, but it only gets better. Um, I searched for, now this is awesome, I searched for Flavobacter and Nylonase. Now Flavobacter, as you know, is the, um, is the, the genus of the bacteria that was found in the pools feeding on, on nylon byproducts. Uh, using a novel, new, invented enzyme called nylonase. So I couldn't find flavobacter as a single word, but I did find flavo and bacter and nylonase together, which pretty, pretty, pretty eerie, isn't it? Um, now, remember, these, all of the things I've mentioned so far, this is stuff that was long, long after Darwin's day. So the fact that he encoded it in this book proves to me that, well, God was speaking to him while he was writing Origin of Species. Um, now this is just for fun. I just was kind of messing around. I found Larry is evil. I'm assuming it, he meant Larry Mitchum, uh, this Bible code guy. Um, but now, now we're getting it. Now move away from biology. Just look for some. This is this is incredible here. Okay. Now you guys better 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 buckle your seatbelts. I found Obama, first black president. Now that I don't know that that's that that. 150 years after Darwin, Obama was elected the first black president. How did Darwin know this? Um, amazing. But then, okay, let's let you know. I got a little excited by this, but my next search, well, I, I don't know what to make of it. Um, let's hope that Darwin was wrong. Um, I found Palin, first female president. I, I, I don't know. If that means I, I didn't find a date associated with it, but I'm going to assume he meant 2012. So we'll have to see if this uh, uh, the great prophet Darwin's prediction comes true on this. Um, and then my favorite, I I just was having some fun and searching for some various words after I ran out of ideas because well I didn't I, again being lazy. I found Larry Mitchum is a Bible code douche. <laughs> Uh, yeah. No one says it better than Darwin, I have to say that. All right, guys, uh, I'm going to end this now. Take care.